Next, we'll add a field to push the pieces in a certain direction. Once again, I'll select all the shards, go to the Fields menu, and this time I'll choose Radial. A radial field pushes or pulls dynamic objects from a central location. I'll go into the Options for the radial field, and I want to change a couple of these key attributes. First of all, the attenuation. That makes the intensity of the field drop off with distance. I don't want that effect. I want the intensity to be constant throughout the scene. I'll set the attenuation to zero. Also, max distance shouldn't be on. Max distance is a hard limit on the extents of the field. I want to turn that off. I'll click Create, and the radial field appears at the origin. I'll grab the Move tool and just bring it up and push it back. And with a positive magnitude, it will push the fragments away from it. And once again, you'll see the simulation slow down at the point of impact. But you can see that the radial field is having an effect now. In fact, the radial field is having too much effect. It's pushing the shards on every frame because it has a constant magnitude. And that is the effect of causing the shards to fly out in a really unnatural fashion. Let's do another play blast so we can compare. Here's that play blast now. And here you can see more clearly because it's running at a constant rate of speed. I'll loop that. Because the radial field has a constant magnitude, it's pushing the pieces away on each frame. All we really want to have happen is that that radial field gives the shards a little bit of a kick for a duration of maybe two frames. I'm going to keyframe the radial field attribute. Just for safety, once again, I'll disable evaluation of rigid bodies. Modify, Evaluate Nodes, Rigid Bodies. On frame 1, with the radial field selected, I'll set its magnitude to 0. Right-click Magnitude and Key Selected. The point of impact is frame 12. That's when I want the radial field to take effect. On frame 12, I'll set the magnitude to, let's say, 10. Once again, right-click key selected. And then just two frames later, on frame 14, I'll set the magnitude back down to zero, and once again right-click, key selected. I can go back to the graph editor. I still got it minimized here. Or you can go to Window, Animation Editors, Graph Editor. Here's the radial field magnitude. I'll click to select the attribute name, then press the F key to frame the curve. What we want here is a sudden transition from 0 to a value of 10, and then suddenly change back to a value of 0. To achieve that, I'll select all of the keyframes, and then set them to step tangents up here on the graph editor toolbar. And now you'll see that curve flat lines on 0 until frame 12, then suddenly jumps up to a value of 10, and then on frame 14, jumps back down to a value of zero. Rewind, go back to Modify, Evaluate Nodes, and turn Rigid Bodies back on once again, and then play in the timeline to observe the results. Once again, to see what it really looks like, you can do a Play Blast. We're getting pretty good results here, but we can do better simply by adjusting a few of the Rigid Body attributes and the Solver attributes so that we can see faster playback in the viewport. I'm going to use stand-ins. I'm going to select all the shards in the outliner. Once again, go into the channel box and scroll down in that rigid body node and you'll see stand-in attribute. I'll click on that and choose cube. And now when I play back in my viewport, it's much faster. It's not as accurate, but it's much faster. And it plays back almost in real time. This way I can experiment and see the results more quickly without having to wait for a play blast. Let's experiment with some of the physical properties 
of our objects. Once again, I can select all the shards. And in the channel box, I can adjust the mass, bounciness, damping, and friction. Mass has to deal with how colliding objects will behave. An object of high mass will have a great deal of influence over an object of low mass. In this case, the mass is not going to make much difference in our animation. But the bounciness will, and that's simply how much the object will rebound after a collision. If I set the bounciness down to, let's say, 0.1 for all the shards, then we'll see a different result. Rewind. We've also got damping, which is basically a chill-out factor. It sort of reduces the inertia carried over from the previous frame. Higher damping values will result in slower moving objects. With a value of maybe 0.5, it's going to have a subtle effect, but it's going to eventually cause them to sort of settle down and stop jittering around as much. If I increase the damping up to maybe 1 or 2, that will reduce jitter in the animation. The friction has two attributes. Static friction is a force that needs to be overcome to get an object moving, and dynamic friction is a force that must be overcome to keep an object moving once it's in motion. I can set them both to a higher value of, let's say, maybe 0.6. And now it behaves more like masonry and less like rubber. Go back down and change my stand-in back to none and do a play blast so I can see a better approximation. Window play blast. Now as you can see, having changed those attributes, I get a much different result. The shards of the bricks don't move very much because they have a high friction and a low bounciness. At this point, I would go back into these attributes and experiment with their values in order to get the look that I want. In order to see the result in real time, you'll have to do a play blast once again. I've adjusted some of the attributes for the shards. I've now got a bounciness of 0.8, a damping of 2, and friction of 0.2. Here's what that looks like in my play blast. If I'm happy with that, then I'm ready to bake the simulation to keyframes.